Good morning. Welcome to the joint uh, hearing with the House Judiciary Committee and the House Committee on Corrections and Institutions. Uh, it is uh, Wednesday, April 3rd, and uh, we are going to be getting uh, a background orientation on bail law and conditions of release, and then we'll be focusing on S-195, and I'll uh, turn it over to uh, Legislative Council. I assume we don't have to do introductions no. or anything. We all if we don't know each other point. by now, yeah, yeah. we never will. Yeah. <laughs> uh, good morning, everybody. Um, happy Wednesday. Um, my name, uh, for the record, my name is Ben Novogrodsky from the Office of Legislative Council, and we will be um, doing an overview of pretrial release, specifically bail and conditions of release. Um, and uh, at some point, there will be this presentation will be printed out for you guys to have handy. And I recommend keeping this um, because it's going to be a, a valuable resource to come back to uh, when it comes to 195 and some other bills, especially in the Judiciary Committee. Um, so without further ado, let's get started. Um, so we're going to start with some important terms and definitions to just keep in mind as we go through this. The first is bail. Bail is actually defined in our statutes as any security, including cash, including cash pledged to the court to ensure that a person charged with a criminal offense will appear at future court proceedings. Now you will hear bail used more broadly than the specific definition. A lot of people refer to bail as sort of all inclusive of um, including conditions of release. Um, in other states, it is not necessarily only a security or cash. But in Vermont, it is defined that way. Um, then there's appearance bonds, um, which is a way bail can be um, achieved. It's a written agreement to pay a specified amount if a person fails to appear. A secured appearance bond is a written agreement and the uh, portion that is paid prior to release. That's usually about 10% of the um, amount that is set by the court. And then there's a surety, which is someone who agrees to be responsible uh, for guaranteeing the court appearance of another um, who's charged with a criminal offense or a person who agrees to be responsible for guaranteeing that another person applies for uh, with the conditions of a peace bond. We're not going to get into a peace bond. It's something that's rarely used. It's actually not even technically part of bail analysis. It's its own separate proceeding. Um, but you want to find out more about peace bonds, I will happily talk about it with you another time. Uh, <laughs> Some question about peace bonds. <laughs> the peace. Um, and then a surety bond, again, written agreement um, to secure the appearance of another and someone that pledges to pay the court a specified amount if that person fails to appear. Um, and then finally, flight from prosecution. This is really the, the, the main purpose of bail, and it's any action or behavior undertaken by a person charged with a criminal offense to avoid court proceedings. That is a defined term. Um, and you, there, a few years ago, our statutes were changed to incorporate ensuring um, to mitigate someone's flight from prosecution to replace ensuring someone's appearance at court because it's a little bit broader than just, just that. Um, so those are the general definitions and terms going into any questions about those terms. Uh, Representative Dolan. So are these bonds that you're talking about, are those examples of bail? Is bail kind of the umbrella and those so are things underneath? Bail it? would be the amount either cash or security. And so bonds or securities um, that would be set by the court. So these are ways that someone can make bail, post bail, without having to pay the full amount. Right. So is there anything in our bail statutes or bail in general that's driven by our state constitution? Yes. And that's important for people to know. And we will be getting to that. Okay. Thank you. Because <laughs> we updated the bail laws a number of years ago, but it's really limited based on what you can do because of our state constitution. Absolutely. Um, and I'll be getting to that in a couple of slides. Um, so any questions about the terms or terminology before we venture forth? Okay, seeing none. So just a general overview of what pretrial release is. 
some general concepts to keep in mind. People are innocent until proven guilty, and that is really the touchstone that everyone should keep in mind when it comes to bail and why people are released and why it's difficult to incarcerate people before they are adjudicated of an offense because they have yet to be proven guilty. So that is the overarching concept that you need to keep in mind when you're grappling with balancing the policy choices associated with bail, um, like public safety. Um, and the concepts of bail and pretrial release are grounded in the U.S. and Vermont constitutions. Um, the Eighth Amendment, which essentially says bail cannot be excessive. And then there's um, the Vermont Constitution, Chapter 2, Section 40, and then Chapter 229 of Title 13, both of which we will review here today. Um, the other concept to keep in mind, the sole constitutionally legitimate purpose of bail, so bail as in using cash or sureties to secure someone's appearance, um, is just that, to ensure a person's court appearance. It cannot be used for public safety um, as its primary purpose because, or um, as a punitive measure to punish somebody um, who may have violated something um, as part of their conditions of release. So that is a really important concept. Just, I mean, no, I the excessive, the excessive or something. Correct. That is. That? Um, so it cannot bail cannot be set to such an extravagant amount that it would be considered excessive and essentially punitive, so that somebody could not make bail. So is there like uh, somewhere where there's a statue or something that goes? And well, there's guidelines on that. There's, I mean, who do you there's case that? law. There's case law. Mm -hmm. um, and in Vermont, I'll get into this a little bit more later, but while bail cannot be excessive, it also does not need to be affordable, um, which is sort of a, an odd concept to reconcile, but it's, it's what the case law says. And so, and we'll get into this, that part of Vermont's bail analysis is consideration of an individual's financial means, but the case law says, that while bail cannot be uh, excessive, it also doesn't necessarily need to be something that they can pay. It just can't be so outlandish that essentially no one would be able to pay it, to pay it or it would be considered punitive. Um, and that's in years of case law. Um, and our statutes are drafted with that in mind, um, but ultimately, you know, it could be litigated again, where if a, if a court were to set bail at an excessively high amount, that's something that I'm sure the Defender General's office would take very seriously. That just doesn't happen. In Vermont, no. And it shouldn't happen elsewhere. Right. So um, if I'm to be uh, arrested for a crime and bail is set, uh, I see in the movies all this time, so, you know, bail bondsmen okay. and things like that. So like, what is that actually Sorry. like? Okay, I need to post a thousand dollars bail, but I can't come up with a thousand dollars. Are there like people in the state to call that do this sort of thing, like log logistically? That's my, that's that my understanding. Um, but my, my understanding also is that bail limits in Ver or bail amounts in Vermont are typically low comparatively to other jurisdictions. And so engaging with a bail bondsman may be difficult because it's also a business. Right. Right. Um, so before you go on, you see, uh, there it says a person's appearance in court, and you were just talking about flight from prosecution. Mm -hmm. um, isn't, can you explain why that now saying appearance in court as opposed to flight from prosecution? Well, this is just what the case law has said as far as what the sole constitutionally legitimate purpose is. Flight from prosecution is what our statutes reflect as the definition, which includes this. Okay, so has it been litigated on whether flight from prosecution is too broad uh, or broader than just appearance in court and whether I don't I don't recall my instinct is that issue specifically has not been litigated as far as the terminology itself. I think it's typically what conduct has occurred and what is being set by the court and whether or not that can is really related to securing <laughs> appearance or mitigating the risk of flight. Thanks. Um, so again, bail cannot be used to punish the defendant or protect the public, but conditions of release can be a, a mechanism of public protection. And I'll get into that later. Um, so any questions about sort of these general concepts and touchstones related to bail? 
conditions of release. Okay. So, uh, flight flight from from prosecution. You have to cross the state border in order for that to come in. No. Yeah. I mean, it's it's fact dependent. I mean, if someone were to leave the state, I'm sure that would weigh heavily towards a flight from prosecution result. But um, it can it's any action undertaken to avoid prosecution. So that could be a litany of things. Um, and I'm sure people smarter than me can give you better examples of that. But it could be fleeing the state, but it may be more than that as well. I was just trying to get to the lower end there, because if you don't, you know, you post post bail and just don't show up. That doesn't does that constitute flight? Yeah. I mean, you, you. Yeah, I mean, it, yes, that could that could be used as you know a factor. So they're they're avoiding the prosecution of the case. Um, if they're not complying with conditions, that can also be another one. Um, and again, we'll we'll. This is all sort of the the, the basis of um, what we're getting into. So Kristen, then John. On the flip side, what's the constitutional basis for holding someone without bail? I'll get it to, into, yeah, into that, that as well. There are, there are three exceptions to hold people without bail, uh, constitutional exceptions. What resources does, I know the judge said bail, what resources does he or she use to, to determine the number? Uh, of the bail amount? Yeah. Um, so one of the, so, We'll get into this a little bit too, but it's based on available information at the time of arraignment. So, um, and and those those arraignments and bail hearings don't have the rules of evidence of, uh, that apply. So basically, anything can be submitted to the court to to prove the conditions or to justify the conditions or to show the person's financial st status. Um, and then the judge will balance a litany of factors. And um, you know, I would suggest. Um, speaking to Judge Zoning when he testifies, really about that analysis that a judge yeah. get, gets into. It's pretty subjective, though. Somewhat subjective. It, yeah, I mean, I, I suppose there is an element, a subjective element, but it is, you know, objectively, the, the same lips of factors are applied to every individual, but every case is going to be fact specific. Okay. Answer. Um, Barbara. <laughs> so, so Ben, um, somebody the other day asked me this question, and I did not know the answer. When I said that Vermont Constitution limitations on bail, they said, but the U.S. Constitution is different in terms of what bail is. Like, why doesn't that trump the Vermont Constitution? So, uh, the Vermont Constitution uh, creates greater protections than the federal the Constitution does. So it's um, it's not that it trumps it; it's just that it's built off of the baseline that the federal government, the federal constitution, has created, which is the bail cannot be excessive. And if somebody's charged in federal court in Vermont, would they follow the Vermont Constitution or the federal? Um, it, so Vermont. you can be charged in federal court for state crimes. Yeah. Um, so I think that's a question I would need to get. Okay, I all right. I just, yeah, I was yeah. like, I don't know the answer to any of these things. So, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So, constitutional requirements. Um, it's like Chair Emmons and you. <laughs> constitutional requirements. Um, so, this will just give you the text of the, the constitutional <clears throat> limitations. I'll break it down on a later slide, but it's in the Constitution, Chapter 2, Section 40. Excessive bail shall not be exacted for bailable offenses. So that's language that mirrors the, the federal constitutional requirement. And then all persons shall be bailable by sufficient sureties except as follow, follows. So that language, all persons shall be bailable is, is Vermont specific, which means everybody has the right to bail or at least is presumed to be subject to bail unless they fall into one of these three exceptions. So everybody can be released on bail. Um, that is not the case in other jurisdictions. But the th no, go ahead. I, well, I have a question about that. So, that language there would that prohibit the legislature from eliminating bail in its entirety, or would that have to be a constitutional amendment? So, when you say eliminate bail, what that could mean? I've heard that to mean a couple things. One, eliminate cash bail, or one, make it so that bail isn't available, so that everyone's incarcerated. Well, what's the 
Right. So nobody's incarcerated and only conditions of release unless one of the exceptions for holding without bail. And I think that would be in line with the constitutional requirements because everybody would be released at that point. Um, so this this is to make sure that everybody is can be released as of right. That they can't just be incarcerated. That didn't answer your question, though. Well, yeah, not. I don't think that answered the question. Because some people want to get rid of bail. They want to get rid of cash bail. Yes. That, can, that we do theoretically, that? can we do that under our state constitution? You could get rid of cash bail. You could not make bail cash only, though. That has been adjudicated by the Vermont Supreme Court as being unconstitutional. It cannot be solely based off of, um, you cannot have people post bail through cash only. All right, so, but... Well, you could eliminate cash-only bail. All right, but that would mean you'd still have the sureties and the bonds and all those, right? Uh, depending. Um, it really depends on... I mean, you could theoretically do away with all of it and just have everybody be released uh, subject to conditions. So does that run into problem with that language? I don't believe so. Okay, all right. Not that that's what this bill does. But people all, may have, different, just people may have differing opinions. Okay. Um, I, you know, would probably behoove me to say... Should, you know, that's probably worth researching a bit more, but based on what I've seen so far, I don't feel that that would be a constitutional issue. So if we did do away with cash bail, could folks be detained and held in a correctional facility? Because right now, yes. right now we have detainees that can't take bail right. or they're held without bail. Would they still be able to be held without bail? Yes. For those that, if but there, are, but it's subject to the constitutional limitations and the very high bar that the courts uh, that need to be met in order to hold somebody um, without bail. And that's current. Yes. Because we have quite a few folks who are detained in our correctional facilities that are held without bail. Yes. And that, and that's again, goes back to everybody is bailable, subject to bail, but whether or not you actually post bail is a different story. So these are the three exceptions. One, someone accused of an offense punishable by death or life imprisonment. It's only life imprisonment now because there are no offenses punishable by death in Vermont. Um, and I'll get into, and uh, the House Judiciary has already had a kind of Primer on this through the walkthrough of S-196. We'll be getting back to that slide in a few moments. Um, the, and the second is basically violent felonies. Um, if someone is accused of a violent felony, there is a standard that needs to be met to hold them without bail. I'll get into, this is in subdivision two here. I'll get into the details of that momentarily. And then the third exception is someone who's awaiting sentence or sentence for okay. appeal may be held, um, basically someone that's already been adjudicated guilty, um, but they're either waiting to be sentenced or they're appealing to the judgment. <laughs> um, a person held, with, held without bail prior to trial shall be entitled to review that determination by a panel of Supreme Court justices within seven days. That's also codified in statute. Um, and then <clears throat> basically in cases where they're where if someone is charged with a violent felony and they are held without bail, the trial needs to be held within 60 days of that, of that time. Um, so that kicks in sort of the speedy trial concept um, where, okay, and again, it's balancing that consideration of you're innocent until proven guilty with you've met a very high standard about public protection, public safety, and I'll get into that analysis, but that's the general concept. If we're going to hold you without bail for um, allegedly committing a violent felony, we're going to hold your 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 trial within sixty days. Um, if for some reason that trial cannot occur within sixty days, then that person is set for another bail hearing to reassess that hold without bail determination. Uh, Barbara, and then Angela. Um, so Ben, I have two questions. One is for the exception of a person awaiting sentence. Mm -hmm. Sentence for what? Anything. If, uh, well, yeah, it so doesn't. It it, well, I mean, a misdemeanor, probably not. Um, but and I'd have to get into the case law a little bit uh, about that. But that is one of the exceptions. Is just and again, it's because that, of that general concept. You've been adjudicated guilty at that point. At that point, so there is more justification to hold you until your sentence actually is. Um, 
you know, that might be a better question for, for Judge Doney as well to, to get his perspective on. The other question I have, you may refer me to Judge Doney too, mm -hmm. but um, I recently heard from a defense attorney about somebody who was in, in jail pre-court pre, um, trial mm -hmm. on attempted murder, and they were in for like two years. Okay. So how does that, how does that happen? <laughs> I, would, that... I would need to know the specifics of the okay. case to really answer that. I, yeah, I don't know. So, so I, I guess I'm wondering if court backlog is a reason that <laughs> we might not. Uh... I, don't, I don't know if court backlog would be a justification. I mean, it may have been if they were held for a violent felony and they pose a threat to the public, um, that it's possible that whenever that bail hearing was set at, at 60 days, that they kept meeting that standard. Um, so that's a possibility, okay. but it's, it's hard for me to say. So also, uh, defense counsel can ask for extensions of time as well, right? Yeah, so that 60 day, there can be waivers of, of that made by the defense. So basically, it's their choice. So uh, my question was related to to uh, Representative Rachelson's question. It, could could there be um, multiple? You mentioned that if it does, if the trial does not commence within sixty days, someone's being held. The trial does not commence. There's a hearing mm -hmm. to revisit the bail question. Would there be just multi every sixty days a hearing, or you know, to and then over yeah, and over not, determine? I'm not, I'm not sure. Okay. Um, I think that's a better question for for Judge Dean. Um, but there's nothing in the Constitution that would prevent that from happening. Not that I recall, but I'm going to qualify that statement that I, I, I need to look into it a little bit more. And now that I'm kind of thinking about what Representative Rachelson asked, it may have been that there was a waiver by the defense. That to me seems like a more, um, more likely, scenario. likely scenario. Gotcha. Um, but yeah, I would ask Judge John. Thank you. Sure. Um, any other questions before we get into more details? Um, and then finally, no one can be in prison for, for debt. But that's <laughs> yeah, at this point. Um, so free trial release statutory foundations. Um, so these are found in section 7554 and others. Um, so you'll see here that any person charged with an offense other than someone held under section 7553 or 7553A, those are the life imprisonment, violent felony, hold without bail exceptions, shall at his or her appearance before a judicial officer be ordered released in accordance with the exception. So that is that constitutional requirement that everyone is bailable codified. Um, You'll we'll also see in 7554A1 that the defendant shall be ordered release on personal recognizance or upon execution of an unsecured appearance bond in an amount specified by the judicial officer unless the ju judicial officer determines that such a release will not reasonably mitigate the risk of flight from prosecution as required. So this, again, just sort of sets the stage of releasing people and has the judge gives the judge that discretion to determine that um, unless, unless the judge determines that releasing them doesn't mitigate the risk of flight. Um, so again, statutory foundations, we'll get into more details as, as we go. Sure. Um, thank you for this. And I'm, I'm hearing the emphasis that everybody is bailable. And this is specific to Vermont, though. Yes. Um, do you have a sense of how special, unique, like for me, I'm like, oh, this makes sense. Um, but are, are we kind of isolated or? I haven't done a survey of okay. states, but this is unique to Vermont's constitution. And maybe I believe that there are other states that have similar provisions, but it is not ubiquitous throughout okay. the country. Okay. So I feel like that's helpful because we might hear stories or hear things um, and to know that we're on a different foundation than what might be happening somewhere else. No, don't don't quote me on this. And so I may be stepping in it a little bit, but I believe, for instance, North Dakota might have a similar provision um, because 
the Senate Judiciary Committee looked at some North Dakota pre-trial release supervision programs. And I remember reading some material nodding to the fact that they're in a similar situation as Vermont, okay. that you can't just incarcerate people unless it's for really good reason. So, so just on that issue, just I know folks may have heard, like Illinois has eliminated cash bail, but they have a different requirements, different constitutional requirements, and they can actually detain people for public safety is my understanding. They have risk assessments to consider whether to detain somebody for that purpose as opposed to flight from prosecution. So if folks do hear that certain places have gotten rid of cash bail, I, know, I think New Jersey has as well, uh, there's often more to the story uh, and, and people may still be detained uh, just for public. And that does remind me too that former U.S. Attorney Christina Nolan did testify in Senate Judiciary. Um, and I think it goes back to Representative Nolan, or maybe it was Representative Rachelson about in federal court that she testified to the fact that they're kind of in a, in a position where they can hold someone for public protection purposes. So I think that answers your question is that it doesn't necessarily apply to federal courts, Representative Rachel said. Um, so again, that's why you may be hearing differing accounts as to what's happening in one place compared to another or in one court within Vermont compared to another. Any other questions on this slide? What? So the scope and limitations of bail. So bail may be used only to assure the defendant's appearance in court and cannot be used as a means of punishing the defendant nor of protecting the public. This is in State v. Pratt and also in other uh, Sup Vermont Supreme Court cases. Um, the bail statutes create a presumption in favor of pretrial release. So again, everybody being bailable, but the courts required to impose the least restrictive conditions of release unless the de defendant is determined to be a flight risk. So again, even if someone when they're relate, released, and if um, conditions are then imposed, which is different than personal recognizance, you can be released on your personal recognizance where you don't have any conditions um, imposed on you. But when conditions are, our statute says it must be the least restrictive condition or set of conditions. So even within that, there's that sort of nod to innocent before proven guilty, um, that we're not going to impose unduly harsh conditions on you um, that are unnecessary. Um, Barbara, cool. right. I'm sorry. So if somebody misses their court date, would they then possibly be held um, because they missed their court date after? It's possible. I would say it's probably unlikely for a single missed court date. Um, you know, there are a lot of factors that could go, go mm -hmm. into that. Um, if they, if they miss it due to car trouble or something, and if there is an attorney there, I mean, in, in my own personal experience, when someone would, would miss, there wouldn't be a, you know, a, a direct punishment. It's possible, but like I said, I think it's unlikely in practice. <clears throat> um, so situations in which bail, secured appearance bonds, or appearance gone, bonds cannot be imposed. At the initial appearance for misdemeanors, if the person is cited for the offense, at the initial appearance or upon the temporary release pursuant to rule five of the criminal procedure rules, which um, I'll get into later, um, for a misdemeanor eligible for expungement. So eligible, um, mis uh, expungeable misdemeanors, unless the court determines that imposing bail is to mitigate the risk of flight from prosecution. And in that case, there is a $200 cap on the bail that can be imposed. So uh, for expungeable misdemeanors, if the court decides this person might be a f flight risk, they can set bail, but it's capped at $200. Because in, in the policy reasons there are probably because they're not to say that there aren't any serious crimes, but for crimes that aren't considered as serious, this is sort of the, the policy decision that was made is that the presumption is that you're not gonna have a monetary amount, but if it is imposed because there's a flight risk, it's it's only capped. It's capped at two hundred dollars. Sure. Um, this is interesting, and I just feel like flagging this because it connects to the ceiling bill that we put. Of like, what is what is that connection? Because um, we move potentially moving to ceiling. This now says expungement. 
I'm wondering if that word change matters or probably. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. This is also a provision that is affected by S195 as well. Oh. Wait. We go through the bill. Two hundred two hundred dollars. I can't imagine that that would really impede anybody that wanted to really flee. How long has that been on the books? I want to say 2017. Give or take a year. Eighteen. Angela. Twenty eighteen, says <laughs> Representative Oliver. <laughs> I passed in seventeen and enacted in eighteen. <laughs> Do you know, Ben, if this is the only um example of a bail amount being capped or prescribed? I believe so. Um, and then finally, the constitutional exemptions for bail are governed by 7553 and 7553A, and we'll get into those right now. Um, so, uh, so the House Judiciary Committee probably remembers this slide because it was handed out um, with our walkthrough of S-196, so bear with me if this is repetitive and for House Corrections, welcome to being held without bail. Um, <laughs> well, we have a lot of people being held without bail. Well, so it's what I think there's a question there about are they being held without bail or are they being held because they cannot post bail? Held without bail. We have data from DOC that was sent to us about all the folks who are currently being held. The majority of folks, 90% of them, I would say, quickly going through this, are being held without bail. And the maximum bail amount, we just went through this, right? It's $9 million. Yeah, it was nine, nine million. million maximum bail amount. Nine million. Yeah. Right. Well, was that the highest one that was set? Jeez, that's what they list. It listed as nine, 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 nine. Yeah, nine, 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 nine. nine, nine. It's nine million nine hundred ninety-nine thousand nine hundred ninety-nine. Okay. Held without bail, maximum bail, and the and uh, this was sent from DOC yesterday, and it takes it goes across all the facilities. Okay. So about, just quickly looking at that, I would say probably about 90%. I would say 90% of the current folks being held in our incarcerated facilities as detainees are held without bail. I don't know if I'm off base, but. but yeah, and, and that document will, I'm having Kayla post it so folks can see that. So, uh, Wayne, then Ken. No, my understanding is, and I, and I heard two different numbers, that we have an awful lot of people that, that cases have not, I heard a 1,700 or 17,000 number, number of people that, that haven't uh, made it to a court decision. The backlog, you mean? Back, backlog? There's like 16, 7. 16, 1600, 16,000, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, that uh, on that backlog that haven't showed up for their trial. And just a couple of things, the, the six, it's 16,000 cases that could be, it's probably quite a bit fewer individuals, right? Mm -hmm. Because they can have multiple cases. And I don't know that they track actually that I know of data of no shows or not, but uh, I know Ben has a comment on So that. something that is towards the end of the presentation, but I think is an important distinction for the committees to understand is that so there's the, the, the hold without bail statutes, which basically is governed by what the person is charged with, either an offense punishable life in, by life imprisonment or a violent felony. But then there's bail revocation, which is a different concept. And so, Professor um, La LaRoche, I think that you're referring to bail revocation, that if somebody didn't show up, um, there's a separate procedure to actually revoke their bail, which again is a very high standard. So I would 
kind of caution to think that a lot of people are being incarcerated because bail is revoked. I mean, I, I do know that it's a it is a tool that has been used, but it is a really high bar to meet. So just I wanted to distinguish between those two concepts that these persons held without bail is really dictated by the offense that's charged and the evidence that is available at the time to support the underlying facts. Bail revocation is really if someone has there are five different bases, but for instance, if someone has essentially tried to avoid prosecution altogether, and um, and that's a situation where um, a bail revocation procedure can be undertaken. And so what I was thinking, the flip side, that they're not, you know, being held, that they're, they're out there, mm -hmm. they've never been apprehended. Mm -hmm. And... You know, we don't have enough people to go out there looking for all of them. I'm just wondering how many of those exist that haven't been apprehended, but they're they're in that total number there. Right. So presumably, and we'll be getting into that perhaps, uh, that if somebody doesn't show up, there can be a warrant for their arrest. Uh, that, that is an option. That's probably data that could be could be obtained. We There's also obtain. someone, there can be a prosecution initiated for contempt of court. That's right now probably the the first um, like a, a VCR violation condition release. It's it, that's the prosecution, so it's really the main enforcement mechanism. And right now, Vermont does not have any pretrial supervision of people who are released. <clears throat> the only accountability is if you get somebody back in front of a judge, which S one ninety five attempts to address. So uh, Ken, then Tom Oliver. So I I think what I heard seventeen thousand people are being held without bail mm -hmm. and that no 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 this backlog in the courts doesn't mean they're being held in our correctional facilities so 300, 380 people are detained uh, as of yesterday from this data what was so uh, how many people are being held without bail because of of bad crimes well the data which I sent to Martin, a member of my committee received this yesterday. <laughs> and if you just thumb through it really quick, I would say about 90% of the detainee population right now is being held without bail. And the bulk of those are felony crimes. And 90% of what number? 300 and no. what number? I got a correction on that. Not quite 400 detainees. 4, 425 as this one. It's 425. But that includes the federal detainees, right? That's total state detainees. Yeah, so it might be less than. Primary federal. No, 67 de federal detainees. On top of the 425? Okay. <clears throat> so 425. So there's around 200 people are being held without bail. At least. More than that. Like if you thought through this, there's a lot of that Yeah, I just didn't. Yeah. Um, Oliver. Tom, Oliver. 370. Good morning. Um, Jet, maybe just a little real life added data. This is what I do. <laughs> so um, you're, we're holding fewer people on bail. Um, so then you would it would be only uh, natural that the people we have in jail are held without bail. Um, so that is going to be our greatest number. We are have um, the, the number of warrant arrests has exponentially grown out of control. It was never like that before. We arrest people all the time who don't show up for court. They repetitively do it, um, but they typically get re-released if that answers anybody's questions because of the bail laws. A, uh, Joe, follow-up question um, for Representative Oliver, um, if he'll be interrogated. Uh, <laughs> uh, Tom, I, I was sort of wondering if you could just expand on that last piece you said. So, like, if you um, were to arrest someone on a warrant for failure, or, you know, to appear, um, you know, with bail, are they then brought before a judge, and then do they have the hearing that they missed, or are they given a slap on the wrist? Is there more bail at that point? Like what what happens yeah. when you actually get them them there? 
Right. So there's been some new developments in the bailouts. Well, the way things are handled because of the bailouts. Sometimes if the crime is something that is $200 or lower in that, you know, that window, sometimes somebody will be arrested and it'll have some indication on the warrant that they can only be arrested during the day. And that's because they put them before a judge um, immediately because uh, during the day, during the week, it's a, a weekday only uh, warrant so that they can get them before a judicial officer. Then there, they go over the circumstances and tell them, you know, uh, they adjust the conditions of release if they need to. But most likely we're going to see that person again in the same situation very frequently over and over. Um, and then you'll have others um, that they are over that uh, expungeable mark. They can't really set bail on. They can set marginal bail um, or whatever, but they try not to set bail most of the time. And they do everything through conditions of release. And um, that's why you're not seeing people held, you know, on bail in jail for lengthy periods of time, really, uh, other than hold without bail. Um, does that make some sense? Yep. And then uh, if you have a warrant that is above that expungeable mark, an arrest warrant, um, you will see people get arrested on, say, say I get caught in a disturbance or something or a police officer stops me on a Friday night and I have a bail uh, a warrant that's a thousand dollars or something. And if I don't have that thousand dollars, I will go to jail until Monday morning. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of how all warrants used to happen. Warrants. If I arrested you, it didn't matter uh, if it was below that expungeable mark or that $200 window. Uh, if I had a warrant, I had to come up with whatever the financial surety was um, on the warrant to get out of jail. Um, until Monday when I saw the judicial officer or the first opportunity a judicial officer was on the bench. Um, if you, we arrest somebody like that during the day, during the week, then obviously they go straight to court. But if the court's not open, they went to jail or they came up with the money or or used a bail bondsman. And bail bondsmen are still active, just not very much. You have to pay 10% to the bail bondsman for him to front the money. Um, and when you have warrants, that are two hundred dollars. They don't make anything, or a thousand for that matter. I mean, they they don't want to risk a thousand for a hundred. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. <clears throat> and, um, so just to kind of focus back on, we're just going over persons held without bail. Those two statutes, seventy five fifty three and seventy five fifty three a. And what you see on the screen right now are those three constitutional exceptions providing the basis to hold people without bail. Um, so life imprisonment, 13 VSA, 7553. These are the elements um, of the statute. So the crime charge is a maximum potential sentence of life imprisonment, of imprisonment when evidence of guilt is great. And that has been flushed out in the case law. There is a presumption of detention under the statute if guilt is great, uh, if that guilt is great standard is achieved. And then if evidence is not great, the court maintains discretion to release a defendant pursuant to the 13 VSA 7554. That statute has sort of been like half seriously referred to as sort of the bail Bible, because that, that, that statute contains all the different conditions that can be imposed, the analysis that the court does. So that, that statute outlines the court's discretion when they release somebody and what they can impose on them and what factors can be considered um, in analyzing which conditions should be imposed. Um, then there's 13 VSA 7553A, which is the violent felony exception. Um, so someone who is charged with a felony, an element of which involves an act of violence against another, where the evidence of guilt is great and clear and convincing evidence shows that release poses a substantial threat of violence to any person and no condition or combination of conditions will reasonably prevent this, the physical violence. So in both of these statutes, there's that guilt is great standard, right? And that is so, and these both include sort of a two prong analysis. So for that guilt is great standard, that is shown where the prosecution must show that 
substantial admissible evidence exists to show that evidence of that uh, guilt is great. So what does that actually mean? They don't actually have to admit that evidence at that time. They just have to show to the court that it exists. And that can be done through um, sworn affidavits, recordings. It can also be done through, through live testimony, but you'll hear through a lot of future testimony, there are a lot of reasons why you may not want live testimony. So for instance, in a violent felony, potentially like an aggravated domestic assault case. Typically these, these bail hearings are gonna be held within, within two weeks of the alleged incident or arrest. And that is a, a very short time um, to force a victim to testify live in court and face their, the alleged perpetrator. So there are reasons, and there's also the other reason where you don't wanna have a bunch of mini trials before the real trial. Um, and so that's why they say there are other ways that you can show this evidence exists other than through admissible evidence, but you have to show it exists. Once that standard is met for the guilt is great standard, then you get into the 7554 standard for life imprisonment, um, which is the rules of evidence don't apply. You can kind of submit anything through um, without adhering to the rules of evidence, but you need to pr present evidence. And then 7 553, there is essentially a court split on how, once the evidence of guilt is great, standard is met, how you prove through clear and convincing evidence that there's a threat of, of physical violence and that no conditions of release will reasonably protect the public. Some courts think that the rules of evidence apply and that you need to have that substantial admissible evidence shown to exist. Some courts think that the rules of evidence don't apply and that you can kind of present anything you need um, but just you don't have to adhere to the rules of evidence to get it admitted. Um, S-196 attempts to address that issue with 7553 to put it on par with 7553, the life or 7553A to put it on par with 7553. Um, but that's really an issue before the Senate Judiciary or House Judiciary Committee. It's out of the Senate Judiciary Committee. Um, but just to kind of give both committees an idea of really the, the the mechanics of how these statutes are are practiced. I'm sure there are questions. <laughs> Move fast. <laughs> Thinking deeply on this one, but yeah. I can move ahead while yeah, go ahead. deeply. Um, oh, and then this this goes uh, again to the 60 day trial requirement for the violent felony and that it can be there can be a waiver. Um, and if there's no waiver, waiver and the trial doesn't commence within 60 days, a, a bail hearing is, is set. Question. Yeah, go ahead. Can you describe the defense waiver? They, they would basically make a motion to the court saying that we, we waive the 60 day trial requirement. Why would they do that? Maybe they want more time to gather exculpatory evidence. But that would be a good question from for you know the defender general's office as well. They they can give you more specific reasons. Any other questions? Fail and risk of flight. So how is someone determined to be a risk of flight from prosecution? So the court must consider, in addition to any other factors, two things at the outset. Shoot, I do have a question for the last one. On the last one. Go ahead, Angel. Uh, I'll, I'll ask Judge Zone. I'll just sure. write it down. Um, yeah, well, I, okay. I'm asking, I'm wondering. I'm Trump a judge. So. Yeah, well, <laughs> I'm thinking back to these, so for the violent felony, 7553A, all five elements have to be present or satisfied or whatever. And right, but there are different standards for those elements. Okay. So the guilt is great standard is kind of that substantial admissible evidence. And then there's the second prong for the abilities for the violent felony, clear and convincing evidence. Right. And when I'm, I'm actually looking at number five, no combination, no uh, condition or combination of conditions will reasonably prevent the physical violence. Is that typically, the, that determination is really uh, just judge's discretion? Right, so, but in, in, in practice, the way this would, and I believe that there was testimony on this in the Senate, the way that this would play out is that someone would be arraigned, there would be conditions set um, at that point. So for instance, using the like sort of domestic violence example, don't have contact with the alleged victim. Um, if 
within the 14 days of those conditions being set and this this hold without and this way to the evidence hearing as these are known being held if that condition was violated that might show to the judge that really there's no set of conditions that can protect the public because if you're if you're restricting them from contacting that victim and in that two week period of time they've contacted the victim that that's evidence to show that the condition may not be effective okay so there there does need to be evidence it's just interesting oh, yeah. that, that doesn't mention evidence it just says no condition or combination well so it's free. it's and it's because you really have to get into the case law yeah. on it okay. and and there is a little bit of a dispute <laughs> about where the substantial admissible evidence um prong ends and where sort of the non-evidentiary <laughs> stuff begins um some and myself included based on the case law that i've read is that starting with uh condition four here that's where the non-admissible evidence standard begins okay there's i know the defender general's office has said that that's incorrect um and that um but i i haven't been able to discern what their true position is yet i think that's something that will come out in later testimony um but by and large um to answer your question is that there is evidence that is presented it's just sort of the, the issues are what's the standard or what's you know or does it have to, does it have to adhere to the rules of evidence to become to be admitted um, but yes there does need to be evidence it's kind of an abstract concept. Thank you. Bail and risk of flight. So how is someone determined to be a risk of flight? Courts consider at the outset two factors. Um, in addition to anything else that the court deems relevant, the seriousness of the offense charge and the number of offenses with which the defendant is charged. If the court determines that a person is a risk of flight based off of those, it must craft the least restrictive conditions of release and must consider on the basis of available information, <clears throat> the nature and circumstances of the offense, the weight of the evidence, the person's employment, the person's financial means, including the ability to post bail, um, their character and mental condition, their um, length of residence in the community, and record <laughs> support flight to avoid prosecution or failure to appear at court. So these are all considerations that the court um, considers in imposing what conditions um, should be ordered. Uh, Troy. I'm just, um, is this, they have to consider all of these bullet points, is that accurate? Um, it's within their discretion, discretion, so whichever ones are relevant. But yes, they can consider all of them and they can consider sort of other factors based on the available information to them. I'm just looking at length of residence in the community and especially as the conversations evolve around how these conversations impact our migrant community. But that's not a requirement. Well, these, these are... Um, these are the things that it must consider, so it is a requirement, but there's sort of discretion as to which which is applicable, given the, you know, the litany of factors, because each person is fact specific. So, yeah, a person's migrant status, maybe they don't, um, they haven't lived in the, the community for a long time. Um, so that could weigh one way or the other, but it could also be outweighed by the fact that they're, they're here for to be employed. Certainly. So that's another factor that's considered that would probably weigh in favor of, um, you know, release and the conditions that would be imposed. Um, and traditionally, um, you know, I, I remember even going back to law school, I mean, sort of the, the that was the sort of recitation that you would always <laughs> give at a bail hearing is that this person's not a risk of flight, they have family here, they've lived here for 20 years, they've been gainfully employed for the last 10, you know, they, you don't need to really restrict their movement. You know, you don't need to impose curfew, you don't need to impose uh, a no contact or that they can't go to a certain place. So, you know, those, those are kind of in practice how it might be discussed. The thing that's not on the list, did they look at priors? 
Um, so it, that could be, the short answer is that it's not an explicit condition, um, but it might be involved in this last factor, which is if they've been charged in the past, have they appeared in court, have they had instances where they tried to avoid prosecution. So there, there could be, and that's something that can be known, made known to the court that might in inherently factor in. But that's also something that's addressed in S-195. Uh, Tom Oliver. Uh, regarding Representative Hedrick's question, a uh, little insight maybe. Um, Police also have to do the same thing uh, with our rules of arrest uh, as far as screening people as, you know, their ability to apply or appear, uh, whether or not we release them on a citation or we have to bring them to jail or do something like that. But um, where, where the, the line was drawn most of the time for us pretty significantly is when someone's from another state. So whether they were from another state or from another country, I think that would be pretty much equal. Does that help, maybe? I, don't know. I think so. Yeah, thank you. And just to close the loop on Representative Harris and your question, um, you know, I do, I do know that, you know, in it, it says, in addition to any other factors, so that does give the court the discretion to consider things outside of what's enumerated. Um, and I believe Judge Zoni has testified in the past that when you're talking about the nature and circumstances of the offense, it could include sort of priors if they're sort of related to what currently had, had gone on. So there is a basis to do it. It's just not necessarily explicit. All right. Okay. Um, so moving on to just bail and conditions of release. And conditions of release related to bail. So it's a really a two-part analysis where you have conditions that are related to bail to secure someone's appearance. And then if those conditions are deemed insufficient, to also protect the public, then additional conditions can be imposed for that public protection thing. So it's sort of a two-factor analysis there. So the conditions of release that related to bail that can be imposed are placing somebody in the custody of a designated person or organization that's basically agreeing that the person's going to comply with their conditions and can also be held uh, responsible um, if the person that they're responsible for um, is non-compliant. Um, you can place restrictions on travel or association during their period of release. You can re require participation in alcohol or drug treatment program and consideration is given to someone's ability to comply with an order of treatment and availability of resources. So if you know there aren't available providers, that's something that would probably be considered in whether to impose such a condition. Um, Someone's financial means are considered. Um, so upon consideration of those, um, you could require the execution of a secured appearance bond in cash or other se security of a sum not to exceed 10%. Um, that deposit is returned um, to, the, to the defendant uh, when required. Upon consideration of those financial means, require an execution of a secure security bond with sufficient solvent secure sureties or cash. So basically just Surety bond, but got to be liquid to an extent. Um, any other condition reasonably necessary to mitigate the risk of flight from prosecution, including requiring the defendant to return to custody at a specific hour. Um, and uh, there can be a no contact condition prohibiting contact or harassment of a victim or witness, which takes a imme effect immediately, regardless of incarceration uh, or release. So those are the ones related to, to bail. And then there's public condition, public protection and conditions, which are largely the same, it's a couple of small differences. Um, I'm, I'm just curious, so, so the ones that we just went through, so some sort of bail needs to be set, you know, if it's a dollar um, in order to get to these conditions of release or can conditions of release be set without bail? Um, like cash, cash or surety bail? Well, I think it's ultimately up to the judge um, where, you know, and this is sort of where the terminology kind of, it's the bail is defined very specifically, but bail is largely thought of as sort of this broader concept. So 
I, I can envision a, um, a situation where, you know, maybe a bail amount isn't necessarily imposed, but conditions of release are, but I think that would be rare um, just because the first primary purpose of bail itself is to secure someone's appearance. And a lot of those conditions are really related to, to achieving that objective. And so then are the protect, protection of the public conditions or do, do you have to have bail and bail <clears throat> conditions to get to public protection conditions? Or can you do public protection convictions without uh, conditions without cash and or conditions? Of well, bail? so the, the statute is a little confusing in how it's structured. Um, and I think that you, you know, I, I would refer to Judge Zoni sort of on his view of this because he <laughs> opined on this a lot where I think in reality, a lot of judges may sort of do it all sort of wholesale. Um, but the way the statute kind of reads is that you do the bail analysis first and you impose conditions. And if those conditions are insufficient to protect the public, then you can consider additional conditions. Um, so and I know that doesn't really answer your question, but um, maybe ask Judge Zoni. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, it's, it's a good answer. Um, the public protection and conditions of release. So these are the conditions that are associated with public protection specifically. So as I stated, if the court determines that conditions related to bail will not reasonably protect the public, then they can impose the least restrictive condition or set of conditions um, on top of those. Um, so it's based on available information. The court takes into account similar factors than what it did for bail, nature and circumstances of the offense, weight of the evidence, family ties, employment, character, and mental condition. Recent history of violence may be considered on bearing on someone's character or mental condition, their length of residence in the community, record of convictions. Um, so, and again, when it's sort of blended together, sometimes gets rolled in, um, or their record of appearance, flight to avoid prosecution, or failure to appear at court. So those are the factors that go into the public protection analysis, and then the conditions of release related to public protection are largely the same, except when you look at the second condition here, um, you can also place restrictions on someone's association or place of abo abode during that period of release. Um, and then you can also suspend a law enforcement officer's duty if the law enforcement officer is charged with embezzlement in an official capacity, and it's deemed necessary to um, protect the public, and then any other condition reasonably necessary to myth, mitigate the risk of flight. Um, and then there can also be that no contact condition. So largely similar with a couple differences. Any question on those conditions? Okay. Getting to the real riveting part, home detention. <laughs> um, so this is governed by 13 VSA 7554B. And home detention right now, it's a program of confinement and supervision that restricts a defendant to a pre-approved residence continuously, except for authorized absences for work, court appearances, um, medical appointments, um, and the like. Um, a defendant who is detained at a correctional facility for more than seven days for lack of bail. So in a situation where they've been bailed, they've, bail has been set, they just were not able to pay it. Um, they may be reviewed by the court to determine whether they are appropriate for home detention. Um, and so anybody essentially can request that review, the department, the court, or the defendant. Um, and then prior to scheduling the review, the Department of Corrections files an assessment of the proposed residence uh, to see if it's suitable for electronic monitoring. And it's usually deemed suitable um, if they have cell service or a landline, because that's really sort of the, the connection, for lack of a better term. Um, and then um, continue. Back up, please. Second paragraph, the word may is in there. Who did you Curious. Okay, they've been in jail for seven days. May be reviewed. Right, because it's dependent on a request. Okay, request by who? The, the court, the department, or the defendant. Okay. Anyway, for my committee, if you remember last year, we did a little bit of work on this because the requests were not being made. 
and we worked with Judge, Judge Zoni to really work with the judges that they start paying attention and they themselves, the judges could um, make that request. And we worked with the judge on that. And the House Corrections Committee will we'll be working to work on home detention on S-195. <laughs> so pay attention. But right? the defendants aren't making the request for that, they're just staying in jail. They can. They can. Sometimes the defense counsel may not want them to make that request. Okay. Or they may not want to make that request for who knows what, or they may not be. Well, and we'll get into sort of what goes into the assessment, but part of it is, again, I, I keep coming back to a domestic violence example, but if someone is held, you know, was charged with such a crime um, and the victim lives at the home, yeah. well, the defense yeah. counsel may be like, no, we're just not even going to go through this process. It's, it's really individual specific. Yeah. Uh, Wink. That word may, I would interpret that to mean that the court could decide not to. Yeah. And they can decide that it's not appropriate. It's the court that makes the decision right. on yeah. home detention. Exactly. But they have to be requested by the Department of Corrections or the defendant or they themselves, the court, make that decision. See, I understand that, but it says may be reviewed by the court so that court is not required to review any of that request. I mean, that's my paraphrasing, so I wouldn't get too... Oh, okay, um, so that's not... But it's, it, it's really... It, it, and the way it's phrased that way is because it's dependent on an actual request. Yeah. You know, they don't just get an automatic review if they've been held for seven days. And so my, my, of course, my thinking, I was thinking that that was actually the way the law was written, is that the court may not take the request or may not may just not want to review it because it's only a review. They, they have the ability to for the court to review it, but the, the court in this case could choose not to review it. No, I mean, I'd, I'd have to double check the statute itself. I, I don't believe, you know, it, it could be exactly the the same wording. Just You see what I mean? I do, but I, I, I don't believe that's how it works in practice. <laughs> Um, so going into the analysis of home detention. So in determining whether someone is appropriate, the court considers the nature of the offense, their prior convictions, history of violence, medical, mental health needs, history of supervision and risk of flight, and any risk or undue burden of persons residing at the proposed evident, a residence, risk to third parties or risk to <laughs> safety that may result from such a placement. So that public safety element is a factor in determining whether home detention is appropriate. Um, DOC can revoke home detention status for any uh, for an unauthorized absence or failure to comply with any other condition of the program and, it, and to return them to a correctional facility. So deep, right now, DOC has the discretion to do that. Um, and then the defendant does get credit for time served while they're participating in the program. Uh, any review of that DOC revocation? Is that something that has to go before a judge, or they just decide? Um, I'm not sure, but I'm pretty sure it's it's it, it can be just decided because they would otherwise be incarcerated without this program. And it's DOC that right now it's DOC that supervises folks who are on home yes. so they would have the authority to revoke. <clears throat> Bail revocation, the other concept. Okay. So this is dictated by 7575 of Title 13. So the right to bail may be revoked if the court finds that the accused has done one of five things, intimidated or harassed the victim, potential witness, juror, or judicial officer in violation of a condition of release, repeatedly violated conditions of release in a man manner that impedes the prosecution of the accused, but the courts have said through multiple court cases that violations alone are insufficient. And there must be a nexus between those repeated violations and a disruption of the prosecution so that it really impedes the ability to prosecute the crime. And that can be something like witness tampering. Um, what the court has said, if you're trying to influence a witness on whether to participate or not, that can disrupt the prosecution. 
But you'll do, you would notice, though, that case law says disruption of the prosecution. The statute says impedes the prosecution. There's a little bit of an academic exercise of what's the difference between disruption and impediment. And, um, you know, you can make the argument that um, an impediment is, is yeah. So just a, a fun little nugget there to consider <laughs> as you <laughs> contemplate everything about bail. And Thanks, by that really need. No, I did it for representatives. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, how special. Uh, uh, so moving on, uh, another basis for this is if they violated a condition or conditions of release that constitute a threat to the integrity of the ju judicial system. Um, the court courts have spoken that, um, you know, only when facts indicate a palpable threat to the integrity of the judicial process, like preventing destruction of evidence or endangering or threatening a witness would rise to the level of that. Um, so again, there's always more than just what the statute reads on its face. Always got to look at the case law for this. Uh, <laughs> and then um, another basis is without just cause, a person failed to appear at a specified time and place ordered by the judicial officer. But again, it's not written into the statute, but there, not, there needs to be sort of that nexus element. Um, and there needs to be that higher standard because the right to bail is a constitutional right to revoke it that has to be a very good reason to do so. Um, and then finally, in violation of condition release, someone's been charged with a felony or a crime against a person or an offense similar to the underlying crime for which after a hearing, probable cause is found. Um, so those are the bases and you will see that S-195 builds out the statute to really incorporate the case law um, so that it is a little bit clearer to those who read it about what's required um, to revoke bail. Any other questions? Is, Go ahead, Ken. Yeah. Is there any stats <clears throat> on the last part of the uh, the last uh, paragraph? Are there any stats on that about how many times that happens? I'm not sure. I'm sure that there are. Um, but I, I don't know what they are. Yep. All right. So, oh. Representative Hedrick. <laughs> okay. What about Troy? Did you have a question? No, sorry. Oh, no. Seeing wow. ghosts of hands. Yeah. Um, it was it was kind of a <laughs> so in conclusion, what does all this mean? Right? Everyone is subject to bail as a matter of right, unless one of the three constitutional exceptions apply. Out of order. Um, bail amounts cannot be excessive, but do not need to be affordable. It is presumed that everybody subject to bail must be released on personal or cognizance or an unsecured appearance bond unless the release will not reasonably mitigate the risk of flight. Um, conditions of release can be tied to both bail and public protection and must be crafted in the least restrictive way. And then the right to bail can be revoked in legitimate and compelling circumstances, a very high bar. Did you put that all together? This, why do you ask? Why does that all mean? <laughs> Just a little intrigued. Okay. Right. So, yes. Did a good did job. It. Did a good job. He gets paid the big bucks for it. Exactly. I mean, I'm paying him a compliment. I don't you know. know about that, but. <laughs> <laughs> so, so um, we're, we're next going to do a walkthrough, but let's take a five minute stretch break first. Uh, and we can go off live. Uh, we're back in uh, the joint uh, hearing uh, with the uh, House Judiciary Committee and the House Corrections and Institutions Committee. And uh, we're now going to have a walkthrough of S-195. I believe everybody has received a copy of it or have it online. So back over to you, Ben. Thank you. Thank you. Um, again, for the record, Ben Okoroski from the Office of Legislative Counsel. Um, before the committee is S-195 entitled an act relating to how criminal uh, how a defendant's criminal record is considered in imposing condition of release. Um, essentially, um, this bill proposes to do four broad things. One, 
change the bail limits for certain crimes, which is what I referenced before about removing a $200 cap for expungable misdemeanors, adding factors for the court to consider and imposing conditions of release, most of which are already sort of implicitly <clears throat> considered by the court, but um, have been codified to ensure consistency. Um, adding new monitoring programs that can be imposed as conditions for individuals who qualify. Those programs um, include the expansion of home detention, um, the revival of uh, electronic monitoring program, and the creation of pretrial supervision. Um, and then also to create and clarify accountability mechanisms for those who violate conditions of release. Um, I previously referenced that um, a VCR, a violation of condition of release, can be um, as a prosecution that can currently be commenced. Um, this creates another proceeding in addition to that to hold people accountable for um, violating conditions of release. And then, as I mentioned before, building out that bail revocation statute to um, incorporate the case law in, in statute. Um, so, turning to the particulars of the bill. So section one amends 13 VSA 7551, which is the imposition of bail, uh, appearance bonds, and sort of their associated limitations. Um, the, the portion here that really changes is you'll see on page two, starting on line 12 and 14, which is you'll read in subdivision two, in the event that the court finds that imposing bail is necessary to mis mitigate the risk of flight from prosecution for a person charged with a violation of a misdemeanor offense that is available, eligible for expungement, the court may impose bail in a maximum of $200. This bill adds language that says the $200 limit shall not apply to an offense allegedly committed by a defendant who has been released on personal cognizance or conditions of release pending trial for another offense. So basically, if they're already charged with that expungeable misdemeanor and then um, they're charged with another crime, that $200 cap um, doesn't have to apply in that in the instance. Right. Um, is that evidence of guilt? Is great standard part of this? No. Or not? No. So that could be a violation of condition of release. Is that correct? Is that can be the additional offense? Um, so it, there can be a condition to not commit a new crime, but it doesn't have to be. It's just if someone commits a new crime and they're already out on conditions, that expungeable misdemeanor cap wouldn't apply in that situation. It's precisely that. But if they violate a condition of release that they stay out past their uh, curfew or they have contact or anything like that, that's not an additional offense for which the bail would yeah, That's not criminal conduct on its own. Andrew. Can I ask a question that kind of backs us up to, before you even really dive, dive into the bill, uh, I'm realizing I don't know where this bill came from and was what the stuck. impetus is. Like, are there, I know there are issue, all kinds of issues with bail and questions about bail. So let me answer that because that's not so much. Uh, legislative Council was asked to draft the bill. Yes. <laughs> that's, that's where that came from. So uh, prosecutors uh, have uh, wanted to uh, address these issues, uh, so it comes from prosecutors. Uh, you will note that uh, we have three bills uh, uh, in our committee on our wall uh, that were, I think, companion bills to what this bill ended up being. So uh, those were introduced by some of our, our members, I think Tom Oliver for one. Uh, Tom has been particular, well, in fact, Tom, if you want, uh, this comes from you as much as anybody, if you wanna just give a quick, why are we doing this Senate. explanation um yeah i mean this yeah i was in the senate as well but i know that that uh tom oliver has really been uh pushing for this are you with us still he he may have gone to get some coffee or oh. that. <laughs> well lucky <laughs> him yeah in any event, so we can we can hear from uh tom later as well we can get that from him yeah, yeah he, i'm here yeah. 
I'm here. Um, Sorry. Can, was, uh, can you just give a quick statement of why we are doing this, uh, Tom? Why why this bill is important? Why? I mean, I, I know that it started in the Senate, but I know this is uh, was companion bill to uh, some of the stuff that you have in your bill. Could right. you just give us a quick overview, a quick idea of why? Well, I think I think sort of, you know, looking at what you've said this morning and, and what I was used to before and maybe the disparities that we're trying to, to fill, I, uh, maybe my <laughs> um, my goals might be different than others. But I think um, we're seeing an awful lot of, of people uh, with, with smaller crimes on the streets reoffending. And I go. I look at conditions in bail are very important tools to to help maybe get. We don't need to put people in jail right away, but we need to there, let their behavior dictate. I think um, where we're going to go with them, and it, and it may be jail for short term um, to get them a little bit uh, grounded and under control and um get them back into a good place even if it's a week or two in between incarceration and a bail review maybe and reassess where they're at something like that i, I just I, I think releasing people on citations and um when we pick them up on a warrant uh at night because we can't bring them to a court or take them to jail and they just reoffend it's it, it's it's not working uh, we're I'm personally seeing uh, it's affected my job greatly. Um, and it wasn't like this before 2018. Um, I don't know what's changed. And the only thing I can think of is what we've tweaked with the bail stuff. Uh, before, you know, someone's behavior, it wasn't unusual to see people for nonviolent felonies being held on bail and some, you know, are the harsher misdemeanors for periods of time and and sometimes i think it was very beneficial I, I i wish there were more services in jail um which there aren't i mean it looks like we're going to have maybe work crew back which i think is a, a, a serious bonus but it doesn't fix the problem where people uh, are not really taking that step forward and, and wanting to uh get better and i think we the only way we can do that if they're not doing it on their own is intervention and sometimes that has to start with some sort of incarceration. But until we have better services, uh, I, I don't know the answer. I just know that we are having epic numbers of reoffense, offense um, right. And that's that's not good. <laughs> right. So so I would also just uh, add in in the testimony we've taken on the retail theft bill, on other bills that we've looked at this session, uh, a common refrain has been that uh, conditions, people are violating conditions. Uh, there's a lot of repeat offenders, et cetera. Uh, I don't Sorry. think that this bill necessarily is going to lead to more incarceration. That may have been part of uh, what um, Tom uh, thinks is part of the answer, but but we're looking at some other, you know, supervision in right. this we'll get to. Yeah. We're, gonna, we're looking at... Uh, uh, in-home detention, we're looking at ways to kind of tighten the supervision of uh, individuals who are on conditions uh, to right. try to keep I, them on. Right. That's, that's what I'm, I guess, was, when I started out, is there's something in the middle, there's a gap in there that we're missing or, or whatever. And, and, you know, I'm certainly a, more is going to help at least a little, um, and, but it could help a lot. And, and unless we try, we're not going to get anywhere. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Back over to you, Ben. Yeah. And just uh, yeah, Joe. Sorry. Um, I've been sitting here for a few minutes, like wrestling with why this sentence on page two, lines twelve to fourteen, bothers me. Um, I still don't know exactly, but I do have at least a question, maybe to help myself figure it out. So, like, the purpose of cash bail is to someone come back, right? Like, that's it. Like it's, you know, come to court, don't avoid prosecution. And like putting aside the question, which I, I don't know why, like this limit was put there in the first place, I guess I'm sort of like trying to figure out if at some point the legislature decided misdemeanors are capped at 200 and that is sufficient in order to get someone back, then why 
if they didn't otherwise violate their conditions of release or anything like that and happen to commit an expungeable offense. And I, I think that's something that we have to also change in this here. I think you should say expunged or sealed, um, considering the work that we've done um, in other in other areas. Um, like why the limit like wouldn't be there for that. Like why it would make a difference. The only point is to get the person back in. Then why the fact that they happen to be out on personal recognizance would make the 200 not apply there. It's it's probably more of a policy question, you know. I, I sort of I think I've answered my my own question there, but I I guess I'm just throwing out that there seems to be an incongruity between this sentence on uh, lines 12 through 14 and the stated purpose of cash fail that the discussion. Okay, I think what may or may not help uh, is when you get to page 24 of the bill, which um, changes somewhat the definition of flight from prosecution. Okay. I'll, I'll... So if we consider them uh, individuals violating their conditions of release, particularly by committing additional crimes, can that be defined as flight, of, uh, flight from prosecution? And the $200 is not in my view, or you know, you can look at more. And still, a question I would have is that there's still the means test for determining what would be an appropriate bail, because it should be something that they sh shouldn't be excessive. Still, even if it's not two hundred dollars, but is it more incentive to not have flight from prosecution in the broader definition of what flight from constant from prosecution is? Is that about? Is, is that? I think that could be one way to think of that. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. okay. <laughs> Wayne. <laughs> so just way on, on, tell me if I'm thinking of it. So that 200 limit shall not apply, which means that the court can give a higher limit, but yes. the court could also, also could decide that we're going to give them 200. Okay. They already have that. They already have two hundred. I know, but that's that's required, right? So right. With, with this, it's taken off that limit for a new offense. For a new offense. offense. But for that new offense, that it does not prescribe a two hundred dollar limit, but the court could do anything it wants. Well, so it doesn't have to impose two hundred dollars. It just may impose bail, which could be a thousand. maximum of two hundred dollars currently. This would remove that limit for a new offense that is committed. But they could make it higher. Well, they could still set bail and it could be more. If this were on the pass, offense. If this were to pass, yeah. Yeah, but this would be, you know, yes, it could it could be in excess of the two hundred dollars. Right. Yeah. But the, if they decided that two hundred was enough, they could they could apply two hundred. Yeah, they'd have discretion. There there's there wouldn't be any prescription. Right. One way or the other, sure. for that specific circumstance. Um, and just for some context about sort of the evolution of this bill, that I think it's it's helpful. So there is also a companion bill in the Senate um, S two eighty seven, which was sort of rolled in in part to S one ninety five. Um, that that uh, bill had some. Um, accountability measures that led to incarceration, but due to some constitutional issues with that, um, the the mechanism was rolled in. The uh, the additional accountability um, new new accountability proceeding was rolled into this bill, but the 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 uh, uh, sanction was changed from incarceration to essentially imposition, imposition of conditions of release and new program. That's helpful. Um, so that's really the change to section one. In section two, uh, this amends 7554 of Title 13, which I previously uh, referred to for the bail Bible. Um, this, you'll notice some gender neutral and, and terminology updates, um, but really the, the, the big change regards the factors that um, are included in the court's analysis and then also the conditions that that can be imposed. So um, I'm going to start with um, the conditions in the first part of the analysis that we discussed. So on the top of page five, lines one through four, um, 
the electronic monitoring program and the home detention program are now conditions that can be imposed um, related to, to bail. Um, you'll see if you scroll down um, onto the next page, those conditions are also added to the public protection factors in the second part of the analysis. Um, and then if you scroll down even further to page seven, lines eight through 13. Um, so this subdivision um, is what's considered in those um, public protection considerations. Um, so right now it's adding to the current considerations of nat nature and circumstances of the offense and weight of the evidence accused. The court can now consider the number of offenses with which the accused is charged, whether the accused is subject to release on personal recognizance or subject to conditions related to protecting the public in another case pending before federal or state court, whether the accused is subject to conditions related to protecting the public for probation, parole, furlough, or another form of community supervision, um, and whether the accused is currently compliant with any court orders. Um, these are new factors in addition to what's already considered um, that uh, there's been testimony saying are largely sort of implicit in the court's analysis, but this makes it explicit in, in the statute that these would be considered in, in this part of the analysis across the board. Any, any questions about the addition of those, those factors? Okay. Not on those factors, but just going, and this might be in testimony, when you're talking about conditions that were added for bail and then for public protection, um, the electronic monitoring, and I think you shared this in your slides too, that is the revival yes. of electronic monitoring. So was this a practice that was used and then it was removed? And <laughs> we can just have a little bit of the history, which I know is probably controversial, but it's probably helpful. Well, I, I will give my depth of knowledge and, and ask the Chair Emmons um, because she's an encyclopedia when it comes to these things. <laughs> um, but basically, I believe it was in 2017, it was the, was it the Windsor or Wyndham County Sheriff's? Wyndham. Wyndham County Sheriff's had a pilot program um, of electronic monitoring that from all, um, everything that I've heard was successful to a degree. Um, <laughs> but, um, it was just a pilot program that sunsetted essentially. Um, and this is a revival of that and an imposition of it statewide. So it never was implemented statewide. Correct. And then it, okay, that's helpful. Well, home detention, folks who are currently in home detention do are on electronic monitoring that's administered through the Department of Corrections. And it is a passive electronic monitoring. It's not active, so it's not real time. It's after the fact. Right, but I, I think it was Representative Dolan, you were asking about the electronic monitoring program itself, right? Yeah, because electronic monitoring is part of, yeah, part of detention as well, but this as an independent condition of release is something that's that's new statewide. Wasn't there like an equipment issue or something? It was, we took care of that last year. The Institutions Committee took care of that. I was shooting something about the, I feel like there was a price issue. It, it, the price issue was because it was active, we needed more correctional staff on staff over time. By going passive, you didn't need as much staff. And the other issue too that was playing in, people needed a landline and very few people now have landlines. So last year we allowed cell service for that. Um, moving on to section three, um, because that really pushes the substantive changes to section two of the bill. Section three is the expansion of the home detention program. So this amends 7554B of Title 13. And if you scroll to page 11, um, this is really where the first substantive changes are, are made to the procedure. So you'll now see that in addition to the court, DOC, and the defendant, the prosecutor is added to as one of the the people that can um, request a review for the appropriateness of home detention. And that is because the eligibility has been expanded to now include um, a defendant who has allegedly violated conditions of release or of personal recognizance, um, not just those who are held um, for failing to post bail. So it expands to those who have violated conditions as well. 
Um, and so that's why the prosecutor can now make the request for the court to do uh, eligibility determination, essentially. Um, and you'll see um, farther down on the page on line 16 and 17 um, that, you know, the term assure his or her appearance in court when required is changed to mitigate the defendant's risk of flight. That is just to keep it in line with the defined term. Um, this was probably just a Scrivener errors in the past that was not caught. Um, and without going back through the determination of home detention, you'll see that um, on page 12, subsection C is amended. This is the failure to comply. So you recall that previously DOC had the discretion to recall someone to incarceration for a violation. Um, what this now does is that DOC may now report a defendant's unauthorized absence or failure to comply with a condition of the program to the prosecutor and the defendant, provided that a defendant's failure to, failure to comply with any condition of the program um, for a reason other than fault on the part of the defendant shall not be reportable. So essentially, if someone um, you know couldn't make a medical appointment or their car died or there's some other extenuating circumstance, um, that wouldn't count as something that would be violative. Um, to address a reportable, a reported violation, the prosecutor may initiate a review of conditions under the bail statute, 7554. Um, a violation of conditions proceeding pursuant to section 7554E, that's that new proceeding that um, I explained that I'll get into in a bit. Um, a prosecution for contempt under section 7559 uh, of this title, that's the current enforcement mechanism um, for a violation. Um, or a bail revocation hearing under Section 7575. So the change, so we're shifting the responsibility from DOC to the court. So, you know, DOC is still responsible for overseeing these individuals, but, but the court is the ultimately the decider. Yes, exactly. So what, I mean, we have a, court problem already not we have we have a court problem with things not being able to get through the court mm -hmm. this is going to make it worse um it, it may there's testimony also that it may it could also help because um what that testimony has said is that every time someone is brought to court that's another chance to confer and either negotiate a plea agreement or expedite resolution of the case so on the one hand yes it would Add to the court's docket, if you will. But on the other hand, it may expedite um, resolution of the case. I, mean, I don't have a, an answer, but I'm just wondering if um, what you're seeking to accomplish might be written into what DOC is required to do in these kind of cases. What do you mean by that? You know, let's, let me let me get back. Let me think about it a little more. But I'm I'm just wondering if, if there might be another remedy or another solution. Well, the 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 reason that this was discussed as being needed to change is because since you're changing the eligibility, so it's ex being expanded from those that would otherwise be incarcerated if not for the home detention program. This now includes other people now that wouldn't have that threat of incarceration. They've just violated or allegedly violated conditions. So now you're talking about a more restrictive condition because think about it, home detention next to imprisonment is probably the most restrictive condition that you can impose on someone. So you really have to balance that through the court. You can't give, I think there would be constitutional issues if you gave DOC full discretion <laughs> to revoke um, uh, home detention um, for those individuals that would otherwise be out on bail. Um, by, so I think that there does there there, there needs to be a, a process separate and apart from DOC's discretion in this instance. Okay, I'm glad that. Uh, Tom Oliver, you're on mute. Sorry, I'm just trying to catch up. A little bit distracted. Um, so. I, you're looking to add home detention to the list of possible uh, 
things to do for conditions of release. Is that it? Free trial? Yes. Yes. Yes, it's it's added to the okay. list of conditions. Oh, okay. And so I guess I guess what would be the sanction ultimately there we need something, you know, if 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 they completely ignore home detention, what are we going to do? So those because... are enumerated on the four options are on page twelve. Okay. Um eleven through fifteen. So there can either be another bail hearing where the court would assess someone based off of the conditions um, outlined in 7554. There's the new proceeding that I'll get into. There's a contempt proceeding or bail could be revoked pursuant to 7575 altogether. So those are the four sure. accountability mechanisms, if you will, for an alleged violation. Okay, so I'm just procedurally thinking home detention is going to be in lieu, in, in lieu of, of incarceration, but there's still going to be the ability to set bail. Yes. You're going to have bail, but they won't go to jail. They'll go to home detention. Well, home detention started as a way to release pressure in our incarcerative setting in holding detainees. So yeah, they, I, I, they're I think a detainee. I was in... So instead of holding them in a correctional facility, they're being held at an appropriate home setting. Right. I think I was in the very first hearing when it was done, to be honest with you. Um, I, I'm just trying to, are, are they going to still, still set bail in this circumstance that you're only going to be in home detention versus uh, incarceration? They could. I mean, there's nothing that would restrict the imposition of bail if you're, if you're confined to home detention. Right. So if somebody was confined to home detention versus incarceration, I think it would be very beneficial that if we had a reasonable bail set, they knew the consequence for ignoring their home detention. And then they could have their bail revoked. If, if there's no consequence, I, I feel we're just, you know, uh, chasing a rabbit down the hole. That's my concern. Well, and, and I hear you, Representative Oliver, and, and this, this, these four procedures is that a, a accountability that consequence for violation of home detention mm -hmm. okay so it can be imposed as a condition of release if you're suitable yeah if you violate then these four mechanisms can hold you accountable for that violation okay yeah, good I, I i haven't read that yet i'm <laughs> jumping in late here so that's okay but thank you i appreciate it thank you um so going forward, um, you'll see an addition of subsection E at the top of page 13, which outlines program support, that the department may support the operation of the program itself through grants of financial assistance or contracts for services with any public or nonprofit entity that meets the department's requirements. So basically, they can contract out if they don't have the staffing to um, operate the program itself. Get back to where where we were. Is that going to go where I, where to the violation or the yeah the failure to comply, comply portion? Because when someone's imprisoned and they violate what they're you know if they do violations inside the prison, if they do things wrong inside of the pr prison. DOC has the ability to take action. Because right, they're under the custody of the department. These are under the custody of the department. Also, no. No, they're under the supervision. Like it's they're the, like so. It's not. It wouldn't be custody per se. Um, not sentence yet. They're, yeah. They're, oh, these are not sentenced. Right. Not no, sentenced. no, no. So this is okay. pre-trial. So everything here is pre-trial before okay. sentencing. So while do so DOC is the entity that's being used to supervise these individuals, but they're not under the custody of the department at that point. I, I was thinking. I think I was thinking that they were sentenced. I was, on, I was on the wrong track. Uh, Karen, uh, this is not regarding what what ledge council shared, but just curious what the path is going to be for this bill. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're in, working in what, on it. In what sense? Of which committee? Because I'm just oh, looking it so, up. I was so, like, oh, so what committee is it in? It's going to go to us. But we're going to work on the DOC parts. Right. And we have to decide if you actually are going to take jurisdiction or not. Right. Hopefully not. But but we'll work know, it just, out. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, so, it might be like sure. five. Yeah. 
Just tell me where I need to go and why. Yeah, we'll tell you where you need to go. That nicely. And and speaking of that, we've got an amendment to one of our bills on the floor this afternoon. So about quarter of twelve, we're going to have to scoot. Out. Yeah, we'll we'll finish up by quarter twelve, even if we have to yeah. come back to. Um, so we finished home detention with that program uh, addition of program support. Section four is the addition of that new proceeding um to hold people accountable so basically the court may determine that a condition of release was violated upon notice and a hearing uh to the defendant and this is on for orientation is on page 13 about a third of the way down um whenever whenever a defendant's alleged to have violated a condition uh ordered pursuant to 7554 the defendant may be arrested or cited in accordance with rules 3 or 18 of the vermont rules of criminals procedure to appear before the court in which the conditions of release were ordered. Um, a judicial officer has discretion to issue a warrant for the arrest of a defendant charged with violating con a condition, and the defendant shall appear before the judicial officer. Um, the defendant alleged to have violated a condition may appear not later than the, ne the next business day following the arrest or citation. This is commonly known as a flash site. Um, and this is done, I believe, in. Um, relief from abuse orders um, or, 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 or RFAs. Um, so this creates a procedure where someone who's alleged to have violate appears the next day, um, which was a very, I would say, purposeful policy decision made um, by the Senate Judiciary Committee um, to get someone in front of the judge as soon as possible. Um, the prosecutor may also request, um, so at this appearance, there are a couple options that can occur. Um, the judicial officer may review and modify the conditions of release under 7554, but the prosecutor may also request at the hearing that the judicial officer schedule a summary hearing in accordance with subsection B of this section or elect to commence um, a contempt prosecution. Um, but you'll see later on, they've got to choose. It's an exclusive remedy. They can't pursue both a proceeding under this section and a contempt proceeding. So that's a choice that the, that the prosecutor needs to make. So at this hearing. What makes something a summary hearing rather than a regular hearing? It all is handled like sort of at once. Okay. Um, but I, I think there is a more technical definition that I would need to, to look up. I think that's fine. I'll handle it once. Yeah. Good and, and for, <laughs> for perhaps my colleague, Zonate, can give you a little bit more <laughs> explanation than I can at this moment. Okay. Um, so um, upon request, they can schedule that summary hearing to determine if the defendant violated a condition of release. The state has a, the burden of proving a violation by a preponderance of the evidence. Um, you'll see information stated in or offered in connection with any order need not conform to the rules of evidence. So it is treated much like a bail hearing where the rules of evidence don't apply. But the judicial officer does have discretion um, to um, take live testimony if, if deemed necessary. So doesn't need to uh, adhere to the rules of evidence, but the judge can make the call and say, we want to hear live testimony about this um, to really, and that would help adhere to the rules of evidence. Um, so let's just say it's failure to, um, rules of evidence don't apply plus a little bit. Um, and uh, the judicial officer shall issue an appropriate order addressing the alleged violation pursuant to subsection C, so there are a few ways that these violations can be disposed of. Um, the officer, judicial officer needs to consider various factors. Um, if the violation of a condition does not otherwise constitute a crime, if it does otherwise constitute a crime, um, the nature of the underlying offense that the defendant's charged with, um, basically the defendant's criminal history, prior convictions, history of violence, medical, mental health needs, history of supervision, risk of flight, and any risk that the defendant poses to the public. So upon a finding uh, by the court that someone did violate the condi a condition of release, the judicial officer must impose the least restrictive in, um, condition or combination of conditions to reasonably ensure the defendant's court appearance, mitigate the risk of flight, or to reasonably protect the public. Um, and that's a new factor, really, that can be considered in the imposition of these of these conditions. And again, you'll see that they can use 7554 to impose those conditions. So it's 
from that list again, or the person can be placed in the pretrial supervision program pursuant to new section 7554G, which I'll get into momentarily. Um, but if the court determines that a violation condition also constitutes a new crime, the prosecutor may also pursue bail revocation. Um, so there's another level of discretion permutation that can hold someone accountable depending on the evidence and prosecutorial discretion. And you'll see subsection D at the bottom of page 15 is that exclusive remedy provision that basically the prosecutor needs to, needs to choose um, one uh, enforcement mechanism or the other. Um, so just if you could summarize, what, what does 7554E give us that's not 7554? Um, well, I, I think it's probably what's in, not in 7559. 7559 is right now the only real enforcement mechanism, um, and it's a prosecution for contempt of court for a violation of conditions. 7554, um, I mean, I, I suppose that those that conditions can be modified at the request of the prosecutor or the defendant, you know, sort of at their behest. Um, and then the, the, the court can then impose further conditions, but there wouldn't really be um, sort of a greater accountability other than 7559, which is a separate criminal proceeding prosecution to hold them in contempt. So this is essentially a second enforcement mechanism alongside 7559. And I would say it's a policy consideration for the committee about the value of having a second proceeding um, uh, alongside 7559. Does that, does that make sense? Because 7554 is really the bail conditions. And I, I think that the purpose of this in 7559 is a little bit different. It's really to hold people accountable for a violation of conditions, not just giving the court discretion to impose more because it, it permits them to do more. So was there consideration of just modifying 7559? There was testimony um, from Judge Zone, I think, about that possibility. Okay. So we'll um, it, it was discussed, but it was this was what was decided. Okay. All right, thanks. Um, section five is the revival of the electronic monitoring program. The language of this largely mirrors the form, the, the language that had previously sunsetted for the pilot program. Um, the intent of the program is to insist with ensuring the defendant's compliance with conditions of release, mitigating a defendant's risk of flight, or reasonably protecting the public. You will see those three phrases repeated many times in this section because it's really the purpose of it. Um, program and administration, DOC shall expand and manage the electronic monitoring program for the purpose of supervising persons ordered to be under electronic monitoring as a condition of release in addition to or in lieu of the imposition of bail pursuant to 7554 of this title or placed on home detention pursuant to that, the, the home detention statute. The department may support the program's monitoring operations through basically contracting with third parties that are public or non profit um, entities. Um, the procedure is that the court, the prosecutor, or the defendant um, may, um, may request that the court determine uh, the appropriateness of someone to be placed into the program. After a hearing, the court may order the defendant be placed under, the electro under electronic monitoring, provided that the court finds that placing the defendant under electronic monitoring will assist in ensuring compliance with conditions mitigating risk of flight or protecting the public. Um, and this is where on the top of page 17. Um, in making a determination, the court considers. Sorry, can I, I just want, it, it just caught my attention in section two on page, uh, at the bottom of page 16. Um, I'm assuming this is deliberate with any public or nonprofit entity so that exclusively uh, prohibits us from using for-profit. Correct. Okay. Yeah. That was a specific change. Thank you. Um, so in making the determination, um, the court considers the nature of the offense, criminal history, um, and any risk or undue burden that the person poses to um, someone residing at, at their residence, risk to parties, or risk to public safety that may result from the placement into the program. 
Um, the department is charged with establishing written policies and procedures in a manual to be used by the department, any contractors um, or grantees that engage with the department um, and the courts. Um, and then failure to comply with conditions of the program. Um, the DOC may report a violation to both the prosecutor and the defendant, provided that the defendant's failure to comply, again, is not their fault, basically. Um, to address a reported violation, the prosecutor has a few options. Review conditions under 7554, um, pursue a violation of conditions under the new proceeding, pursue a prosecution of contempt under 7559, or to hold a bail revocation here. So again, similar accountability rules, but just through different programs and um, that can be imposed on the individual. So this would be to hold them accountable for violations of that program. So if DOC contracts out for these services, okay. I'm understanding that that service would realize there's been a violation. Then they would report to DOC. And uh, they would report to, um, well, I guess and then DOC it's, not, it's not detailed specifically, but presumably... <laughs> There's always dangerous in prison. Yeah. That, yes, it's the department's obligation. Well, not obligation. They have the discretion to report. Um, but, yes, if they contracted with them, they would be a contracted with the department. Presumably, they would need to abide by the department's own requirements. Okay. okay. So we'll do some work on that. Sure. That's where some of the issues happened before mm -hmm. on the pilot because the concern was who has jurisdiction over the person? Is it the entity that's supervising them? Or is it the entity that is pro providing that contract to that private provider? Right. I mean, and again, the another presumption is that there's still the policies and procedures manual that would be provided to these contractors. I really would hope that the Department of Corrections would address that specific issue, but yes, I, it's also something that could be more specific. Hmm. Any other questions? Um, that's a All right, let's get to pretrial supervision in section six. So this is halfway down page 18. For the purpose of pretrial supervision, very similar. Uh, assist eligible people through the use of evidence-based strategies to improve pretrial compliance with conditions, to coordinate and support the provision of pretrial services when appropriate, to ensure attendance at court appearances, and to de decrease the potential to recidivate while awaiting trial. Um, you'll see that there's a definition of absconding that's been incorporated here. Um, uh, Chair Emmons, you know, and, and Representative Morrissey may be the only ones that recall dealing with that definition a couple of years ago. So it is now incorporated into this statute. Um, so pretrial supervision, what is it? Um, it's to supervise defendants who violate conditions of release pursuant to those two enforcement mechanisms. The new, the new one established under 7554E or the contempt prosecution. Um, or for those who have not fewer than five pending dockets before a court, um, pose a risk of non-appearance at court proceedings, pose a risk of flight from prosecution, or pose a risk to public safety. So those are the people that the program is meant to supervise. So I assume that that five pending dockets is to not have everybody shipped to this program. It's just the higher needs individuals. Correct. I believe that that was the policy consideration. Okay. So this is adding a layer that doesn't exist right now. Correct. Okay. Which part? The whole thing. <laughs> uh, Barbara. Barbara. And so start with the pretrial, right? That you and <laughs> Brett Morrissey that. did? Well, so the pre- absconding. Uh, what? The absconding. Yeah, don't, don't. That was just the absconding definition. Yes. I wouldn't. The, the, the whole pretrial supervision program is new. Yes, it's new. Right. And then the, the layer, I believe, that Representative Dolan was referring to is who's eligible for such a program. So it's not just going to funnel people who are arraigned and subject to a bail hearing right away. It's only if you've violated and been adjudicated under the two enforcement mechanisms, you have 
not fewer than five penny dockets, um, or you pose a risk of non-appearance, risk to the public, or, or what have you. So it, it narrows the funnel, if you will, about who gets into the program. So what I'm looking for, just so this is flagged, which I've never used that word in six years, but <laughs> conditions of release well, isn't that. working, which is contributing to our court backlog, I think. I just, that's just what's going through my mind, okay? That's why I brought that up and where this language is coming from and all that. Thank you, sir. Barbara? So when Representative Dolan asked her question about a new layer, I was thinking she meant a new layer of like Department of Corrections being involved pre-adjudication, mm -hmm. pre-trial. Um, and you're saying that that's narrower for people. So not everybody who is pre-trial would be eligible for something under DOC. Um, for the pre-trial supervision program specifically, correct. Right. Just that narrower group that you just were saying. Yes. And I feel like the last time we had a joint hearing or one of the times, we were talking about how DOC's role usually is not involved in trial. Pre-trial. Pre well, well, so I just want to kind of figure out, is this a new yeah, and, yes and, and no? Right, I mean, so no. they are involved in that there are people being detained. Uh, and, and they're, and that's true. Yeah, and home detention. And, right, right. And the way I look at this is that we're just, these are individuals who perhaps could use some more supervision. And if you look around, who are you going to assign for supervision? DOC just seems to be the... And choice. Correct me if I'm wrong, but like in some other states, there the the courts have staff that do like it's in a more neutral. Yeah, and then it's just the the you know a, probably a history of policy decisions to get to this point where yeah, I just why DOC wanna... has assumed some of these roles as opposed to expanding the court's role in supervising right. such individuals. Because we also talked about it with diversion, right, with trying to. Yeah, so, okay, I just want to kind of name it and say it. I think you also have to remember, post-adjudication, people are on probation. They're not under, they're under the court. DOC supervises. I know, right. So, yeah. Right. No. Same thing with furlough. <laughs> furlough, they're under <laughs> DOC. Right, that's right, okay, yeah. Um. So just getting into that supervision aspect, so DOC is responsible for supervising those placed into the pretrial supervision program. The department shall assign a pretrial supervisor to monitor defendants in a designated region of Vermont and help coordinate any pretrial services needed by the defendant. So that's another role about basically putting them in contact with um, the supports that they may need um, as well. Um, the department shall determine the appropriate level of supervision based on evidence-based screenings of those defendants eligible to be placed in the program. Um, the supervision uh, methods include use of the department's telephone monitoring system, which my understanding is it's essentially an automated system notifying them of appointments and things like that. Um, telephonic meetings with the pretrial supervisor, so just over the phone, in-person meetings, or any other means of contact deemed appropriate, which could include FaceTime or Zoom calls things of that nature. Um, so it gives them discretion um, and also doesn't necessarily um, require certain levels of supervision, you know, and that's largely to accommodate um, maybe the, 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 the landline and cell coverage and, and, and other things like that, um, connectivity issues. Um, if the court determines that the defendant is appropriate for the program, they issue the order placing the defendant and setting the conditions of supervision. So the court can sets the conditions of supervision and the, the, the department basically has the discretion on how to carry that out. Um, at the request of the court, so this is the procedure now, that the prosecutor or the defendant, um, the def excuse me, at the request of the court, the prosecutor or the defendant, the defendant may be reviewed determine if they're appropriate. The review is scheduled upon the court's receipt of a report from DOC determining their eligibility. This is kind of similar to the home detention process. Um, a defendant held without bail 
pursuant to 7553 and 7553A are not eligible for pretrial supervision. Um, a defendant eligible, um, a defendant is eligible if they violated conditions pursuant to section 7554E or the contempt statute have not fewer than five pending court dockets, poses a risk of non-appearance, a risk of flight, or a risk of public safety. The court may order the defendant to be released, provided the court finds placing the person under the under pretrial supervision will essentially ensure those, those things. Um, and in making such a determination, the court shall consider the nature of the violations, nature of the circumstances of the underlying offense, defendant's criminal history, um, and any other factors deemed appropriate by the court. Um, for subsection E, this is compliance and review. Pre-trial supervisors shall notify the prosecutor and use reasonable efforts to notify the defendant of any violations of program supervision requirements committed by the defendant. The reason why reasonable efforts was included, um, there was discussion within the Senate Judiciary Committee about if someone is unrepresented um, and they may not keep their address and contact information up to date, that basically you do the best you can to contact them. Um, upon submission of um, a pretrial supervisor, supervisor sworn affidavit by the prosecutor, the court may issue a warrant for the arrest of the defendant who fails to report to the supervisor, commits multiple violations of supervision requirements, or is suspected of absconding. So that's really the only time there's a distinction between people notifying, pretrial supervisors notifying the prosecution and defense of any violation, and then a prosecutor's ability to actually enforce those violations. So it's a little bit of a higher bar for the prosecutor to really initiate um, that, that arrest um, or request for limits. And then the defendant, again, is flash cited to appear um, the next business day um, following the arrest to modify the defendant's conditions. And then at the request of the court, um, a uh, defendant um, can, uh, excuse me, conditions may be reviewed. Um, the court may also issue an appropriate order in accordance with the follow following. So this is basically like an assessment of compliance. If someone is compliant uh, with all conditions of the pretrial supervision program for at least 90 days, they may receive a reduction in their supervision level or may be removed from the program altogether. However, if a defendant does violate the conditions of the program, um, they may receive an increase in supervision or other sanction permitted by law. And then subsection F was added um, that the whole program is contingent on funding. So basically, if the program's not funded, it's not operating. And those funds could come from grant monies or state budget? Um, appropriation. So the pretrial supervision program established in this section shall operate only to the extent funds are appropriated for its operation. And then sec- Are you implying we don't have money to run government? <laughs> I'm not implying any. Oh, I just check. Policy note. Policy. That's a policy. Yeah. 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 It's quarter up. Yes. You have two minutes. Two minutes. Two minutes. I can do it. I got one little. Oh, well, all right. We're going home fresh. Yeah, well, I, guess he's, I just derailed you. Uh, I'm not taking questions. I, I'm just <laughs> asking a question. I'm just really lagging, uh, like Ken, um, page 18, uh, line uh, 18, where it says the pretrial supervision program shall supervise defendants, but later on, obviously, it, there's discretion there. And so I wonder if it should say, upon court order, this pretrial supervision program shall supervise just to make that, because as it currently reads in that section, it seems to be they have to do it, um, but they only have to do it if they're ordered to do so. So I'm just flagging that for later discussion. Okay. Hmm. Um. And I'm not reading anything in here that um, that says this, but I want to be clear that the pretrial supervision uh, program is not um, electronic monitoring. It doesn't include no. electronic no. monitoring. It's not electronic monitoring at all. All right, so I suggest uh, we'll be back here 10 minutes after the floor and we'll give you 10 minutes to go over the last couple of things because I'm sure there's gonna be some questions on the revocation of the right to fail. I don't want to rush with that. I mean, that largely just incorporates our case law. 
Yeah, but I think we need to we need to make sure we understand that in, in critical position uh, portions. Uh, but then we'll also be hearing from Commissioner Demel, and hopefully oh. the floor won't take too long. Hopefully you won't have a bunch of questions on or your patriots in your party. Well, we're so no, I'm, I'm not here at three o'clock. You're not here at the three o'clock. All right, so um, we will take this up when we get back to it on Friday. I guess we can just separately do that. All right, but this afternoon, we'll but this afternoon we're going to have Commissioner We're Demo. both back here. So corrections and his back here. Mm -hmm. at three o'clock. Here, I can very briefly just give a very general overview right now of the remaining sections, if you'd like. All right. Yeah. I mean, go ahead, and if you need to, I'm going to skip yeah. over. Yeah. They need to go, but uh, we have another. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, 